1982. He has been conferred uh, third highest civilian award in the year 1992, Padma Bhushan, and in the year 2000, Padma Bhushan. So we are lucky to have a great uh, scientist with us uh, today on the occasion of National mm -hmm. Science Day. And Dune University is marching towards mm -hmm. excellence in the field of teaching, research, and extension, mm -hmm. and especially in the field of scientific research and science education. Uh, we have, uh, we are, we made our presence felt to the academia in a very short mm -hmm. span of time. Our two faculty members, our two scientists, have been, you know recognized as a top 2% scientist by Stanford University recently. So we are lucky to have a great academician, noted educationist as head of the family, or vice chancellor. Uh, Dr. Professor Surekha Dangwal is a great educationist, noted academician. Under her visionary and dynamic leadership, all the faculty members, scholars, and students are all set ready to excel in their uh, field in their uh, particular domain where they belong to. So we are lucky to have our honorable vice chancellor here in this morning on the occasion of National Science Day. As the theme for this year is a sustainable future, how we can use uh, optimum use of science and technology. In every sphere of life, a scientific approach is very important. So neither we need to go for excessive exploitation and use of the natural resources, neither, neither the resources should be underutilized. So what is required that is optimization approach, and that cannot be achieved without scientific temper, without scientific uh, intervention in every sphere of life. So today we have with us uh, all the faculty members, scholars across all the schools. Doon University, since its inception, is known for its quality education in teaching and research. So every year, our scholars, our faculty members, and students are contributing significantly in their uh, field they belong to. Mike so muted. once again, I extend hearty welcome to all the faculty members, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Surekha Dangwal. We have very senior professor uh, uh, with us, Professor R.P. Mamgai, Registrar of the University, Dr. M.S. Mandrawal, Professor Hals Dobal, Professor Rajesh Kumar, Professor Arun Kumar, convener of the program, Professor Achilesh, Professor Vijay Sridhar, Professor Preeti Mishra, we have uh, Dr. Nitin Kumar, Dr. Shikha Hemad, uh, Dr. Himani Sharma, Dr. Charu Divedi, Dr. Komal, Dr. Sudhan Sujosi, Dr. Ismita Tripathi, we have Dr. Bipin Saini. Professor D.D. Chonyal, Dr. Chandrika Kumar, Swagata Vasu, Dr. Narendra Rawal, Dr. Archana Sharma, and all faculty members are here to celebrate uh, National Science Day. National Council for Science and technology communication in the year 1986 submitted a proposal with government of India and they asked the government of India to designate uh, 28th February as National Science Day. And government of India in the year 1986 accepted the proposal submitted by Council for Science and Technology Communication. And right from 1987, every year on this uh, 20th February, we are celebrating National Science Day. So Uttarakhand especially is known for uh, its uh, science temperament as uh, most of the educational institutions in the state and before uh, creation of the separate hill state, we were part of the Uttar Pradesh. But particularly this hill region is known for uh, its uh, scientific institutions. In India, we have Bengaluru, where uh, maximum number of uh, national institutions of science and technology are uh, established. Then we have Lucknow. And I think uh, Dharadun is the third state of the country, a third city, where maximum number of uh, scientific institutions are established. And this has led 
a great uh, you know significant and great role to create this scientific temperament across the state so we are lucky to have uh, today dr k kasuri nangan sir with us uh, he will bless all the faculty members his scholars and his students and our honorable vice chancellor madam always trying to create a distinct image in the academia by her um, uh, untired and tireless uh, efforts uh, we are trying to excel in the field of uh, academics uh, including teaching research and extension so that uh, we can create a distinct image not only in india but globally so this is the time this is the period of uh, global presence uh, we are trying to uh, make our presence felt to the academia with our scientific with our unique and original contribution in the field of research and uh, teaching with these words once again i extend hearty welcome to all the faculty members uh, we have with us uh, all the learned colleagues participants from uh, different uh, you know state different institutions different universities uh, have joined i request all the participants to uh, mute yourself and put off your camera too uh, so that we can have um, seamless presentation of uh, a legendary scientist and we can we all will be benefited with his presence with his valuable you know words and his words of wisdom so all the participants the scholars are requested to mute yourself and put on put off your video for a smooth conduction of the session with these words i would like to invite honorable vice chancellor madam to deliver welcome address and brief about the progress, progress of the university honorable vice chancellor madam good morning to all of you it is my proud privilege to extend a warm welcome to each one of you on behalf of dune university to commemorate the slogan vigyan sarvada pujyate especially i feel honored and privileged in welcoming our chief guest a renowned space scientist former chairperson isro and chairperson committee for national education policy 2020 our honorable prime minister while inaugurating the draft of nep and i quote currently the education system focuses on what to think but this nep 2020 under the leadership of rishi scientist dr kasturi rangan focuses on how to think unquote after 75 years of india's independence with metamorphosis in our education system sir you have introduced a system of education that is bharat ki shiksha bharat ke liye thank you so much sir i think our country bharat that is india could not have expected anything better than nep 2020 only a scientist can deal with how to think aspect of anything and delve deep into the problem of the psychology of our children and in higher education as well thank you so much sir for sparing your valuable time to share your knowledge and wisdom with our faculty members and students of across uttarakhand i welcome to all our vice chancellors of uttarakhand professor hemchand pandey ji vice chancellor medical university uttarakhand professor ops negi ji vice chancellor uh, open university uttarakhand professor sunil joshi ji ayur uttarakhand ayurvedic university professor bhandari soban singh jina university uh, almora professor tripathi sanskrit university uttarakhand i can see many scientists from different institutions and i can also see some of our brightest teachers of physics from 10 plus 2 colleges they are connected with us with their students and they are the best by introducing not that they were awarded rashtrapati award or full bright scholarship but they are great because they have introduced the creative mm -hmm. methods in their teaching and cherished the passion of teaching science in our schools i welcome all the faculty members mm -hmm. of dune university registrar dune university officers and officials of dune university
I extend a warm welcome to Professor Ujjwala Chakradev, Vice Chancellor, SNDT University, Dr. Lina Gahane, Advisor, National Accreditation and Assessment Council, NAC, Bangalore, and Dr. Madhuri Marathe from Samvardhini Nyas, New Delhi. We have requested Professor Vasudha Kamath, Chairperson CEC, Inter-University Center of UGC, and member of National Education Policy Draft Committee with Dr. Kasturi Rangan. And she wrote to us that listening to Dr. Ranjan is really a treat not only to the mind, but to the heart and to the soul. Ma'am, a very warm welcome to you as well. National Science Day is celebrated, we all know, on 28 February each year to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by Indian physicist Sir C. V. Raman on 28 February. This is his birthday. Bharat has always been a society mm -hmm. celebrating science, logic, invention and creation in our daily day lives. So I take this opportunity on this science day to express my deep sense of gratitude to all our Rishi scientists right from Kapil Mini to Dhanvantri, Aryabhat, Vishwakarma, Sushrut, Nagarjun, Bhaskaracharya, Varamira, Ramanujan, Hargovind Khurana, C.V. Raman, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Swaminathan, uh, Homi Bhaba, Satish Dhawan, Vikram Sarabhai, and today's our speaker, Dr. Kasturi Ranganji, who made our life uh, more comfortable and easy and connected to the masses, connected to the poorest of poor in their discovery, in their inventions. Today, we cannot imagine our survival without science. And if you see in the light of war of Ukraine and Russia, we find that in today's world, people have taken it up. That is a challenge for us that where there is science, there is power. During our colonial past, the colonizer, defamed India and misrepresented the Orient as irrational, unscientific, sensuous, and emotional, whereas they have glorified their West as rational, technologically advanced, and sci having scientific understanding. This is the time that after independence, with the legacy of the great Bharat knowledge system, our great scientists contributed not only in the space science, but in every walk of life with their discovery, with their creativity, with their invention, that India is uh, becoming a superpower in every field of life. But we have to see that how to use science, that is a challenge. And being a person of being a student of literature, I feel that the greatest scientist at certain verge of time become a real Rishi, become very spiritual, having the knowledge of cosmos, having the knowledge of this universe. And they have given in India the teaching of mm -hmm. metaphysics that is beyond this physical world, beyond this mundane life, far from this madding crowd, that how we can make the life not only comfortable, but peaceful and spiritually advanced. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasturi Ranganji, having this commitment in national education policy that we have to teach our students and have the commitment on this special day, that we have to teach them to learn from their tradition to the technology. They have to take pride in their food, in their culture, in their mother tongue, in their everything, whatever is Bhartiya. With this commitment, I again extend a very, very warm welcome. We have more than 425 people connected to us. We welcome all of you, each one of you. We have all the academic council members also. I can see Professor P.D. Mm -hmm. Juyal and Professor Tejinder Sharma and all our executive council members and academic council members are very, very uh, enthusiastic connected with us to listen to this great Rishi scientist, Dr. Kasturi Ranganji. Thank you so much, sir, and very, very warm welcome on behalf of Dune University. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Vice Chancellor, madam, for inspiring and your motivational welcome address. I'm sure that under your dynamic leadership, we all faculty members are, you know, making our hard and efforts to take the university to the highest level of academics. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, madam. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Arun Kumar to introduce 
our chief guest dr k kasuri rangan to all the participants thank, thank you professor pahe honorable vice chancellor dune university professor surekha dangwal esteemed heads of many other leading scientific and technological institutions of the country renowned academicians colleagues and students it is a matter of uh, honor and privilege for me to introduce a person of international repute dr k kasturi rangan he is an astrophysicist he completed his bachelor of science with honors and master of science in physics from bombay university he received his doctorate in experimental high energy astronomy in 1971 while working at the physical research laboratory prl ahmedabad he has wide ranging interests in space science applications technologies national and international science related policies and legal regimes he was the indian space he was with indian space research organization isro for over a period of nearly 35 years including nearly 10 years as its chairman from 1994 to 2003 He worked on the design and development of early satellite system of ISRO and played a key role in shaping of India's remote sensing satellite capabilities. Currently he is Chancellor Central University of Rajasthan. He is Chairman of Governing Board Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics Pune. He is also the chairperson of NIIT University Nimrana. He is member of Atomic Energy Commission. He is emeritus professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. He is also member of Council and Trust of Raman Research Institute, Bangalore, and he is honorary distinguished advisor of ISRO. He was nominated. He was a nominated member of Rajya Sabha during 2003 to 2009, and later member of the Planning Commission during 2009 to 2014. More recently, during July 2017 to December 2018, he was the chairman of the committee that drafted the national education policy. And at present, he is the chairman of the national steering committee for developing the national curricular framework. Dr. Rangan is a member of all the four national science academies of India and several international academies. he is member of the international astronomical union and a fellow of the world academy of sciences he is an academician of pontifical academy of sciences vatican city and honorary fellow of cardiff university uk he is the only indian to be conferred the honorary membership of the international academy of astronautics he has won several awards including shanti swarup bhatnagar award in 1983 83 fourth sies sri chandra sekrendra Saraswati National Eminence Award in 2001 from South Indian Education Society Mumbai he has also been the recipient of brock medal in 2004 lnd emil memorial award in 2004 and won karman award in 2007 baswa shri prashasti 2020 award from shri muruga mut karnataka he has been conferred with Rajyot Sava Prashasti 2014 from Government of Karnataka. He has also been the recipient of highest civilian honors, Padma Shri in 1982, Padma Bhushan in 1992, Padma Vibhushan in year 2000 by the President of India, and the award of Officer of the Legion d'Honneur by the President of the French Republic of France. I welcome you, sir, and invite you to deliver deliver your lecture. Shall I go now? Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning to all of you. I am delighted. to be with all of you on national science day 2022 an annual event which has become a powerful source of inspiration for the younger generation interested in science and its allied pursuits this is a memorable occasion to me for two reasons the first is because i am delivering this talk at doon university which is an institute that symbolizes the spirit of the 21st century education i am happy to note many of the attributes of doon university are aligned with the national education policy 2020 in particular the vision and mission of your university 
clearly highlights the emphasis on children, students, and learning to learn centered pedagogy, value-based learning, conducting multidisciplinary research, providing a conducive environment for researchers to engage in pursuit of excellence among many others. Situated at the foothills of the idyllic Shivali range, your campus provides an enchanting ecosystem of peace and tranquility that could inspire the best of creativity and originality among you, my dear students. I would like to congratulate the Vice Chancellor, Professor Surega Gangbal, and her team of academics, including Dr. Arun Kumar, Head, Department of Chemistry, for raising the profile and stature of this center of erudition to laudable heights within a short period. The second reason why I'm proud to be here today is that the National Science Day is celebrated throughout India to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect by Sir Sebi Raman. I am delivering this talk from the very institute that Raman founded and nurtured towards creating an ecosystem for excellence and legacy in high quality research. I would like to emphasize the seminal contribution to physics by C.S. S. V. Raman, in a sense monumental, both in scale and scope. He redefined the way in which science was done in India. In the words of one of the illustrious scientists of this country and a close associate of Professor C. V. Raman, Professor Ramasheshan, he asked for this to say, and I quote, to Raman, scientific activity was the fulfillment of an inner need. His approach to science was one of passion, curiosity, and simplicity. It was an attempt to understand. To him, science was based on independent thought combined with hard work. Science was a personal endeavor, an aesthetic pursuit, and above all, a joyous experience. And I unquote. In this particular talk, I have chosen this talk with respect to integrating science and technology to advance the frontiers of astronomy. This I chose for several reasons. One of the important thing is I myself worked in this area, an exciting area. I did my PhD in astronomy. And therefore, I'm familiar with this area a little better than many other subjects. That's the first reason. Second, astronomy in 21st century is going to make a major mark on the human under understanding of the universe. And the kind of instruments that are being deployed or planned to be deployed are some of the finest in terms of the advances in technology and the ability to see the furthest reaches of the universe. So that is going to be really the subject of the 21st century. And I thought connecting it with the best of the technology is all that is important in terms of advancing the technology. And therefore, telescopes become central point to the observational capability and seeing the universe further and further and closer and closer to what we say as a Big Bang origin. I start this talk with the first of the telescopes that were made in this connection. You know, the Dutch spectacle makers, Hans Lipschy and Sakaria Johnson in 1608, and Jacob Metiers independently created the first known telescopes. Apparently, as always, there is this such a possibility. There is a saying that there is a youngster who came to the shop. He put two of the lenses and looked at one of the towers around Amsterdam. And he found that that particular one element in there was showing itself to be a little bigger than what normally one sees with the naked eye. So he this brought you the Dutch trifactical maker who saw in it the possibility of a distance viewing. And thus was the idea of a telescope born. Galileo, in the process, made this, adopted this principle and he made the first telescopes to look at the moon, the Venus, and the Jupiter. Discovery of the moons of Jupiter and its changing position with respect to Jupiter set in motion the ideas of the celestial bodies. Newton and Kepler, as you know, 
I've given, converted all these into universal law of gravitation and laws governing elliptic orbit. A combination of a new technology, intuition and mathematics led to the birth of modern astronomy. And that is what we are going to see how this has grown over the years. And this is what I would like to convey to the audience. Many of them I know are students with looking forward and aspiring to do great things in life, particularly things which are inspiring, exciting. And 21st century certainly promises, as you will see in this particular lecture in India, especially many things that are in store for many of you youngsters. I want to say at this stage that the science and technology progress, they go, go, to the, to, go to, together. If, what, what I want to say is, the, if you look at certain developments in science, that has paved way for new technology. I would like to, for example, bring in the question of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance phenomena. Many of you know what it is. But then when this was discovered, it revolutionized the MRI as one of the key medical diagnostic tool. So magnetic resonance imaging system came out of this phenomena of the nuclear magnetic resonance. Just to give an example of a new science led to a new technology and of a societal value. Similarly, if astronomical imaging methods got considerable boost when the development of a low noise rugged charge coupled devices became one of the key detectors to look at the distant objects. And they are today, you know, used in commercial cameras. There is every one of our mobile today carries a CCDs. The CCD charge coupled devices were the outcome of the earlier actual as aspects of astronomical research, especially detecting the stellar system. So what I want to put in this is a kind of a symbolic way. Uh, this was actually told by Professor uh, Herman Bondi, uh, who was, you know, one of the authors of the famous uh, Bondi and Gold, uh, the theory of continual creation, in contrast to what uh, George Gamow said, the theory of the Big Bang. So Bondi was one of the authors of the theory of continuity. Today, this question but he was one of the brightest scientists in those times. And he said that when you take a step in science, you, you are enabled to a step in technology. And when you take a step in the technology, you are enabled to the next step in science. And it goes. And that's why the progress in science and technology, they go two, two together. And this is a symbolic view uh, based on the utterings of um, the, 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 the Bondi, Herman Bondi, a very famous physicist. Now, I will use the next few minutes in trying to give you a little bit about the kind of telescopes that are now coming in. Most nearly all these telescopes are international in character. What I mean is 30 meter telescope is an international telescope being promoted by the California Institute of Technology. It is a 30 meter, one of the largest optical telescopes that will come up on the ground. It is now being located at uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii with the most good seeing conditions. Six square kilometer array will be similarly one of the largest radio telescope that the previous one is an optical and infrared telescope. Square kilometer array will be a radio telescope. India is a partner there too. The third one is the laser interferometric gravity radiator LIGO. This is a very, very interesting development. The gravitational radiation detection, the one that was predicted by Einstein nearly 100 years ago. It took us 100 years for the humankind to detect these radiations. Today, it's a very confirmed detection of the gravitational radiation. LIGO is the instrument that has been developed, one of the very advanced technology instrument by Caltech and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I will say something about this because India is again a partner. The last one I would like to touch upon is the James Webb Satellite Telescope. In telescope, which has taken 25 years to build, to be one of the largest optical telescope with infrared capabilities to be located in space. So it's a space optical telescope. The previous one is a gravitational detector, which will be a kind of what you may call as a multi-messenger astronomy, which we want to talk of 
30 meter telescope and per square meter they are in electromagnetic waves LIGO this is gravitational waves with James Webb telescope again electromagnetic waves so we are talking and then there are other radio, particle radiations and so on so today besides multi wavelength observation that is possible with a 30 meter square meter and James Webb we are also developing the multi messenger telescope where you got different areas of energetics that come from outside like the LIGO or the neutrino astronomy or cosmic ray astronomy and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of a trend that astronomy is moving in the 21st century. How did the telescope go? If you look at how the, as you know, the, 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 the kind of uh, growth of the telescope has been very systematic depending on the technology improvements that were possible at a particular point in time. Ever since the Galileo's use of the five meter, the five centimeter telescope in 1609, I put that here, uh, the angular resolution, which provides you the ability to separate out two objects in the sky, uh, with even when they are very close. So it's a question of how close you can detect an object separately. That is angular resolution. So you can see from 10, 10 arc seconds. We have virtually cross point one arc second in the Hubble Space Telescope, Space Telescope. So you can see that in exponentially there is a growth in the angular resolution. And what does it mean over the time? First, the theoretical limit of how well a telescope can resolve two closely spaced objects is given by, you know, this Rayleigh criterion, a theta is equal to 1.22 wavelength and diameter. What it means is there is a diffraction, a physical law which limits the ability of the telescope to look at two objects close to each other, which we call as the Rayleigh criterion. It is 1.22 wavelength by lambda distance. What is important to note here, the minimum resolvable limitation is inversely proportional to the aperture of the telescope. What I mean by aperture is we normally call it as a diameter. So 5 centimeter aperture, 1.2 centimeter aperture, 5 meter aperture and things of that kind. And that produces the inability of a certain angular resolution. So, however, these light which towards the, as a, the tra travels, as I told you, is limited in its resolution, not as you move further and further. It is, there is a limit mainly coming out of the diffraction characteristics of the optics used, and therefore you call it as a diffraction limited. There is another major problem of limits of seeing. So you call it seeing limited resolution observation. And that is because the atmosphere is not very calm. It is turbulent. And when the light comes through the turbulent atmosphere, the incoming light gets disturbed in terms of um, the, its movement. And therefore, it indirectly reflects on the resolution. And that is why you develop what is called as an adoptive optics. You come across this very often in the future telescopes. This is a technically, what you try to do is that uh, the atmosphere and varying refractive index layers, which distorts the incoming wave front of the optical signal, uh, producing seeing limited condition is corrected by means of what you call as addressing the incoming wave front. C is distortion seed with comparative use, standard candles, and therefore then correct it with respect to uh, certain computations and models and things of that kind. And this can be done onto a deformable mirror. So the mirror can be deformed to correct for this kind of a thing. So that is adoptive optics that is being used, very complex, very com computational intensive, but very fast in terms of reaction that you need to give. So these are some of the very interesting aspects of the new technologies that have been adopted to overcome the atmospheric turbulence. The diffraction limit of course is a natural thing. So we can push it to the diffraction limit. So that is what I show here. I don't want to dwell too much on this. Again, this is another way of looking at it. The larger the collecting area, the larger. So increasing the collecting area means the same exposure yields, same signal detection at larger distances. So you are saving sensitivity to see further objects improves when you try to increase the collecting area. And I am showing here on the left side, a kind of a picture which very clearly brings out that if you use a low aperture uh, system, you see the, 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 the star cluster M13, 
is seen with the limited number. The moment you go for a large aperture system, which is shown on the right side, same M13 cluster, you can see the number of objects that you can see within that same cluster. So that is the power of increasing the aperture. And you can see here that Herschel, Palomar telescope, Keck telescope has subsequently increased the collecting area, thereby increasing the detectability of other objects. And currently what I will now come to is that uh, 30 meter telescope, the largest among this set of uh, optical telescope, which will be a 30 meter system, dry jumping from 10 meter system, and how that is going to change again, the way the astronomy will be done. At this point, I would like to say, what I do at one point, just to give you an idea of astronomy as certainly expanded over the last 100 years. As for Hubble expansion, that the universe is not static, it is continuously expanding. And it is also accelerating now. First and subsequent things show that it is accelerating. Structure of the Milky Way, stellar classification, the ability to look at various types of stars, the sun is an ordinary star, but then there are stars in the initial state of formation, stars in the final stages like white dwarfs, chromatron stars, and so on. So stellar classification, supernovae, a standard candle's ability to use supernovae as a distance measurement method because they provide you with their outer radiation, which has got a standard value, which can be considered as a standard candles. And finally, more recently, the very exciting discoveries of, of the planetary systems around other suns and with the potential for detecting life in the coming years. So that is other kind of a thing. And on the other side in the technology that enabled many of these were the photographic plate to charge couple devices improvements in the spectral resolution spectrometers with high powerful ability to give the wavelength dispersal uh, with from 100 to 100,000. Adoptive optics, I mentioned a little bit about it earlier with respect to correcting for the atmospheric turbulences and laser guide star systems to finally lock down to certain specific objects using reference stars and things of that kind. So these are all the kind of new technologies, new methods by which astronomy had made leaps and bounds in terms of progress of understanding the universe. I will now go to the, the one of the major telescopes I mentioned about it, the 30 meter telescope in which India also will be a partner. This is the picture, an artist rendition of the TMT. You can see the size. If I say that the enclosure of the dome is 56 meters and 66 meters across. So you can see the size. This is a colored dome, it's a huge uh, dome. This unique dome design optimizes smooth tracking. So you, you know the telescope has to be slowly tracked, tracking the objects in the sky. So you need a smooth tracking at slow speeds. Adequate venting to minimize thermal gradients within the dome. You don't want to have temperature variations within the dome, which will distort the various sensitive optical elements. And an earthquake proof structure, we obviously don't have to have a problem with even my micro earthquakes, which can affect the optical sensitive optical system. So this is the size of this 30 meter telescope in an artist's view. Now, what is it going to do? On the scientific side, reveal the nature of the first stars and galaxies soon after the Big Bang, within 400 million years, stars and galaxies started forming. And this is a very interesting area. What was the way the stars were formed and the galaxies were formed? What was their structure? Was it very different from the present, some later evolution of the universe in terms of stars and galaxies? That is not much known. And this gives a, throws a light on the early universe. So that is one of the important goals of the powerful uh, DMT telescope. Distribution of stars, obviously, will also be another thing to understand what does the large scale structure of the universe looks like after its expansion to today's uh, uh, to epoch. A study, star forming dusty galaxy areas, revealing new solar system being, there is this optical capability, there has an infrared capability for this telescope. So it can really, well, the, the, the radiation can come through the dusty areas and they can re reveal the formation of new solar systems. And this in turn also enabled direct imaging of planets 
at one astronomical unit from the whole star up to about 140 parsecs away. One, one parsec is probably about 3.4 light years. So what are you talking about 400 to 450 light years away? Up to that particular point, you can even do direct imaging of potential planets around other systems. And subsequently also detect the composition of the elements and molecules of the planetary atmosphere, which will give you clues as to the presence of life in those planetary systems. Now, what is the technology behind this? It's a 30 meter diameter primary mirror <clears throat> with something like 492 hexagonal mirror, mirror So 492 hexagonal mirror segments, each 1.44 diameter. That forms the main 30 meter telescope. The wavelength that it will cover is from 0.3 to 30 microns with a range of 100, factor of 100. Exoplanet detection, I mentioned about it. It has the ability to see with a level of sensitivity that can be 1 in 10 raised to minus 8. So that's the kind of sensitivity. It can see such minute signals. Optics. It has to be made with a very special process. I will show it to you just an example. Segment wavefront error. This had to be always with the optical methods of reading higher and higher. And, and here, 20 nanometers better than this RMS. You have to have the segment wavefront error. And 492 segments forms the 30 meter diameter. And it uses, of course, what I said, as an optic optic system to ensure that atmospheric effects are taken note of. And you can see on the right side some of the early pictures of this telescope under assembly. You can see here how a particular mirror is made. You take a blank. This blank of the mirror, uh, one can see, is a 4.5 centimeter thick and 150 centimeter diameter. It is mounted on a stressing machine. And then a suitable convex shape you make at the top, as you see here. And then it is poly, the, when the stress is uh, when the and the top of convex surface then is flattened and when further the stress is released the original blank becomes a concave segment this concave segment is then polished with ion beam polishing and things of that kind and then you get to the kind of the the the, the, the uniformity of the surface several tens of lambdas in terms of this. So that is the kind of fractions of lambda. That is what the kind of the accuracy, surface accuracy and RMS security the surface is. And this is what is in India. The most important aspect I would like to bring to your notice is India is supplying 100 such segments for that 494 mirror requirement. So you can see the type of technology, the type of optical accuracies and precision that we are looking for. And these are some of them at the frontier of optics. And that's exactly what India is currently involved in, in integrating with respect to the larger, the, the, the TMT system. Uh, the other point I would like to see is that, you know, most of the, the telescope does need focal plane instrumentation. You put a photometer, you put a spectrometer and things of that get the focal point of the telescope so that you can catch the light, the faintest of the light because it is telescopic characteristic. And those faintest lights are then analyzed. Analysis in terms of the intensity, analysis in terms of the wavelength distribution and many variability and many such things. So this is the kind of instrument that we placed at the focal plane of this is what you call as a wide field optical spectrometer. I want to bring to your attention only one thing. You see the size of these kind of instruments which are put at the focal plane of this telescope. You can see a small uh, uh, the, the, uh, image there. That is the person standing in front of a spectrometer. You can see downstairs also the person who is looking out. Uh, he, that is the size of the person and this is the size of the spectrometer. So you can see the type and size of the spectrometer and the way uh, it is uh, built. So this is just to give you an idea. There is a tremendous science and new directions for astronomy. Technologies are on the cutting edge and India is a partner both in science and technology and contributions are substantial. We cannot be proud of this. I thought I should give you as an example 
of what today India is able to do and that too at the cutting edge and the frontiers of technology and also for the frontiers of science, particularly astronomy. So India's contribution I put down here 90 policy segment, commission coating, coating systems, huge coating system where you have to apply aluminum coating and things of that kind, primary mirror control system. These are all the fine nanometer kind of an area positioning then support assembly, there are a lot of actuators, sensors and things of that kind to organize the proper alignment of these type of uh, various mirrors of 494 mirrors and also entire set of uh, the segment support assembly, actuators and sensors. These are all highly precision and I want to say that these designed and developed by the Indian scientists, particularly the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and other institutes have been cleared by the uh, people who are going to use it in the poor or Paltec, and they got it in the first shot itself. You can see the precision and the professional way in which it has been built and delivered uh, for the use of the telescope. And most of the observatory software, including telescope control system, these are also being made in India, being written in India, tested out and then provided for the telescope operation. I go to another one. This is what you call a square kilometer array. It's a 10 nation effort. World's largest radio telescope when it comes into operation will be 30 times the collecting area of the world's current telescopes. And it will be 50 times more than, more sensitive than the largest radio telescope today. So you can see it's a huge system that will use aperture synthesis techniques it will be a radio telescope at 300 megahertz, which is equal to a wavelength of one meter, and to have a resolution of one arc second, that's the kind of thing they are putting. And if you want to have this, and if you want to have an aperture synthesis, either you can have a 200 kilometer uh, dish, which you know is simply too much to expect, or to other way is to have an array of smaller parabolic dishes, 30, 40 meter sizes, and spread them apart with the maximum separation of smaller dishes at 200 kilometers, and then get the signals from the various ones and synthesize it. The aperture synthesis that's called. It can also use the location at different points of the globe and allow the urban earth rotates. You look at an object in different dishes at different, at different geography, uh, come into picture to look at that object. And then those signals that are there, they are synthesized and then try to make a sense out of the characteristics of the source with a very high sense of resolution and sensitivity. So this is the aperture synthesis uh, thing. The idea of this set telescope is that it will be a 10 nation effort. India is involved in the development of many of the aspects of this telescope again, world's largest radio telescope. And the key scientific problems again is proving the dark ages and the epoch of reionization. I would say that soon after the Big Bang, up to the up to about 400 million years uh, the the universe went through a dark age this was primarily because it was filled with particle soups the electrons protons and neutrons and then they started cooling and in the process the new protons uh, became the, the hydrogen neutrons and protons became deuterium and subsequently helium and so this took in, in, but the initial stage where it was all particle matter, the light that was a part of the product could not escape simply because they got scattered away. So there was a dark age and that is the 400, first 400 million light years were dark ages. And then came the epoch of reionization. And so there is another phase in between was the formation of stars and galaxies and so on. Then there is another problem which is the origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism. The, if I want to say that the Dark Ages is not at all understood, what is the early 400 million light years of the universe's age, what it was like, and what kind of physics went through, are the standard models of fundamental particles applicable to this kind of a thing? There are many questions that are there, and so 21st century hopefully will have answer for some of these very fundamental questions regarding physics. Origin and evolution of cosmic magnetism is another thing. One doesn't know how the cosmic magnetism came in, how did they start there today, they are distributed, what kind of structures they have in the universe. So one need to understand this to understand what is origin because cosmic magnetism certainly plays a very critical role in the evolution of the universe itself. 
And lastly, I want to say again, this telescope can be used for a cradle of life and astronomy. Look for um, in their life, look for astrobiological problems uh, related to life giving molecules and things of that kind. India is contributing to the benefits, develop an advanced control and monitoring system, narrow center of the observatory. You can see the brain of the observatory of this large telescope is a telescope manager, which is being made by the Tata Consultancy Services in Bombay, in India. Develop subsystems of scale like central signal processor, signal, data transport, again being built at the national uh, the, 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 the GMRT which is one of the largest telescope facility of the at the national level uh, carries the, the the giant meter wave telescope which is also considered as one of the largest in the world today at the present time modeling and theoretical studies we will continue to do with regard to the sky car kilometer right away and indian company icetcs is one example they're all working on some of the very advanced technologies especially on areas like software control systems and certain types of signal processing, signal processor and so on and so forth. So there's a substantial contribution from India in terms of advanced technologies going into this world's largest uh, telescope, the square kilometer array. I go to the third example today, which is the existence of gravitational wave. You know, 100 years back, 1915, Einstein predicted the ripples in space time. What do you mean by ripples in space time? The equivalent representation of gravity field objects with non-zero mass. You can see here the web kind of a thing and you put a mass and the mass distorts the space time curve around it. So one can see very beautifully the concept of the perturbation of the space time the geometry by the presence of gravitating bodies. So this is something like accelerating charges, you know, it radiates electromagnetic waves. Similarly, accelerating masses simulate uh, j, 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 radiate gravitational waves so that is the basis einstein predicted it 100 years ago it took 100 years before this could have the semblance of its existence detected simply because these are extremely weak radiations need the doesn't perturb that easily the objects that we are familiar with and therefore it was not easy unless the technologies themselves developed up to a particular so here is a very good example why the detection of gravitational wave had to wait for 100 years before it could be detected. We need to develop several new technologies and you will see some of them later. So that is the reason why it had to wait for 100 years. But then science and technology, that is where I want to bring in again the emphasis on the relationship between science and technology, which results in the growth of both. Here, understanding general relativity through the new technology, the new technology evolving into this kind of an instrument, LIGO, and also those technologies which are also used for many other purposes, but they had to all have a developmental status to conform to the requirements of a general theory of relativity gravitational wave detection, which became possible only in the last few years. Earliest of this was done, of course, in 1969, if I remember, in University of Minnesota, Professor Joseph Bieber was one of the first to see whether the, the prediction of the Einstein regarding the gravitational waves uh, could be detected on the Earth. He used large aluminum tubes, you can see that, and he tried to hang it and look at the small perturbations when the gravitational wave passed through them. These are perturbations in the nanometer, even, even less than nanometers. So one is really looking for a very, very sensitive moment which also is the outcome of a filtered effects of several other terrestrially originated disturbances. This was no easy task and during his time he could not do this with the kind of instrument that he put down, even though once he did declare that he seemed to have discovered a gravitational wave, but that was not accepted by the scientific community. The real confirmatory test on the Einstein's gravitational wave came by the detection of a binary system, a Taylor, so Holtz Taylor binary, this is the Holtz and Taylor are the two discoverers. So they they saw they went through a binary system which was radiating. And this frequency of radiation, they uh, and also the orbital period, uh, they monitored very carefully over something like 20, 25 years, about uh, at least for 15, 20 years. 
and they found that there is a reduction in the orbital period of this binary system and this orbital period could not be explained because they happen to be pulsars and uh, therefore they have got the standard cattle in terms of the timing arrangements a natural clock in the space with high precision and when they did that we found that the, there was a certain way in which the, uh, the, pulse, the um, pulses were reducing in terms of the orbital period detection and you can see here it was coming down and you can you can see cumulative shift of the periodic the period strong from 0 to 40 as you came down by 2000 for 1975 to 2005 you can see it was coming down the period strong time and this they tried to relate it to any other kind of a thing except for the fact they could not find any physics that can explain this except for the fact that it was conforming uh, to the fact that between the two it was radiating away gravitational radiation and once you radiate away the energy the energy was coming down energy coming down was that the objects were coming closer when the objects were coming closer then you have the periostron time changing and becoming lesser and then the, you know this was originally when you have uh, this uh, radiation in the pilot art system they they create what is called as so originally again predicted by Dickey that there will be a quadrupole radiation, uh, not bipolar radiation, and the quadrupole radiation, the radiation reduction, reduction and the, uh, the radiation showing the value of uh, periostron time and the periostron time coming down because of the loss of energy by radiation, because of the relativistic, general relativistic effect. They were all beautifully explained by this observation of the reduction in orbital period. So that was a very conclusive evidence that the rotate, rotate the revolve, binary starts rotating with each other radiates and in the process starts closing down in terms of final equality so this was announced by Holtz and taylor and they got the nobel prize for this in 1993 an exceptional discovery of an early gravitational detection not on the lines of what today we have now claimed the confirmatory aspects of the gravitational radiation using what one calls as uh, 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 LIGO. Here you can see, I, I would like to see the gravitational waves affect the distances measured between objects as they pass through them. And you can see there's a relative change in the distance between two masses is termed as a strain. So when you have the two, uh, two objects kept at a particular point and you have a gravitational wave which goes through that, they perturb the relative change, the distance between the two. And we are talking of perturbations which are 1 in 10 raised to 21. That is the level of the pattern. So we are really looking for this kind of small distances to be detected. And this is what happens in the physics. You have the spiraling objects, maybe either neutron star, black holes, or a combination. And then they, as it keeps radiating, they come closer and closer and so you can see the wave here becomes the in terms of what the, the the strain value here and the timing here you can see it starts closer and closer between the period becomes faster uh, the, the period becomes uh, smaller and so the rotation becomes faster and then suddenly when they are very close to each other you can see there is what is the chirp signal and this chirp signal essentially the final stages of the collapse between the two objects and then you see a black hole black hole merger in this particular case and uh, that's there are the various com computation character what i want to say about this particular chirp signal and the corresponding wave which slowly co 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 closes as the objects become more and more closer is the fact that there were many the calculations of this initially because when you get a signal of this time how to make a view of it how to interpret it so that is where a lot of Indians, Professor Balayar, uh, Professor Durandar from Ayuka, Professor Balayar from Raman Research Institute, they all worked on this for their lifetime. And they came out with this kind of things. Beautifully, their predictions, which were mostly relativistic in terms, general relativistic in terms of the various characteristics, ultimately give a prediction of this type. And that is what was precisely coinciding with the kind of thing that happened when a black hole and black hole coalesced. And so one can see 
the remarkable contribution of Indians, and I will only say the several Indians who are working on this uh, template for the kind of expectant signal from the graph row backward merger, were their names from their thing in the very first announcement of the paper from Caltech and MIT about the detection of the gravitational waves using, of course, the LIGO, the one that we will see just now. Again, a moment of pride for us because such an advanced area, difficult area, complex system, and a kind of phenomena that happens in this game. We took 100 years to develop the capability and thinking. Indians were a part of it, and a lot of Indians have successfully done this in terms of the calculation, which was beautifully validated in the actual observations. I, I will just quickly go through the detection. So you have the two objects coming closer and closer. And when it comes closer and closer, what Balayar, Vishweshara, um, Ranjiv Durandar, what they did, both with respect to the kind of uh, template they created by modeling this use as general relativistic equations of Einstein. And then this was then put to test. And this is what the two instruments that were developed by the Americans one at Hanford and one other living. This is what is called a laser interferometric gravitational observatory. And this is based on the fact that you allow the light to move uh, in an L-shaped system. Um, four kilometers it has to traverse. And in this year to detect better than 10 raised to minus 21 in terms of its moment changes. So that is the kind of challenge. That is why it took so much time. You needed advanced laters metrology, high vacuum systems, and so on. But ultimately, it reached a level of sensitivity that would enable detection of this kind of a wave, gravitational wave, on the Earth of a distant object where there was a black hole-black hole merger. This was detected on September 14, 2015. And one can see how this uh, interferometer uh, the, detected unambiguously this comes because there are a lot of filtering that you need to do with noise and other kinds of things. But these were all developed mathematically. And I want to again say we should compliment that exceptional work of this. And especially to remember them on the Science Day is certainly a remarkable experience for every one of us Indians. So what are the challenges? You know, when you talk of LIGO India, the LISA, the LIGO, we are talking about ultra-stable lasers. I don't want to get into details of this. Ultra-stable lasers, ultra-high vacuum, largest Vico vacuum systems. Unlike probably other than the one at CERN for the uh, particle accelerator, the largest high vacuum systems, four kilometer scale arms with the lasers, displacement sensitivity. This is where I want to say 10,000. You have to detect the movements at 10,000 times more sensitive than the nuclear dimension. Nuclear dimension, you know, is a 10 raised to minus 13 centimeters. You 10, 10 raised to four times that you reduce in terms of the scale. That is the kind of sensitivity that you are looking. Somebody told me that you are talking of a, this is equivalent, you know, to trillions of miles that the light has to travel from here to the nearest star, which is four light years away, uh, up to Proxima Centauri. And, uh, that distance, if you have to measure with uh, a thickness, with, with, a, with a, a scale or accuracy of the human hair, that is the kind of precision and accuracy that one is looking for. So you can you, you don't wonder why it had to wait 100 years for the Einstein prediction to come through. But this is the marvel of the technology. And today's day of technology and science going together the classic example of how the technologies has been pushed to what we today call as these frontier limits and that enabled to detect this particular thing. India is also going to host one of the locations for the LIGO in the future. Work is already established. This is pushed to improve the sky localization. You know, you, you get what you call triangulation and other kinds of things. So India's position will be geographically advantageous to detect the locations on the sky. Many things can be triggered by the LIGO. The observations in X-ray and astronomy, radio astronomy, gamma ray astronomy, all these areas of observations can be dovetailed to the LIGO. And you can look at the multi-wavelength and multi-messenger astronomy approach of looking at the object with multiple wavelengths, 
multiple particle radiation, multiple gravitational radiation, look at the neutrino radiation. So you are really taking off a whole host of astronomy being integrated in 21st century to look at a particular object or a phenomena. On the other side, you create data centers, huge data centers, grid ground computing, control systems, sensor technologies, optical engineering, vacuum tech. So you see the full host of advanced technologies, including quantum metrology, precision measurements. So you see that LIGO, in which India is going to be a partner, India is already working on in the locations have been already identified. This will bring in several types of people with several interests, whether it is in astronomy, whether it is in physics, whether it's in instrumentation and telescope engineering, in terms of other types of engineering, and ultimately computational physics and data and so on. So they are all expected to come together. This is a fabulous program. The present government, in fact, when the first of the, the discovery was announced, the very next day our prime minister said, India is going to be a part of this and we will host one of the LIGO instruments in India. So that is the kind of political support we have received because of the type of instruments and the type of effort that this will trigger in the country. Benefits to India, I mentioned about it, so I don't want to say more about it. Pro role in fundamental science, high and high, high technology in instrumentation, major role in the next generation gravitational wave program. We are all going to be a part of that. And indigenous development of advanced later, development of frequency time standards, development of mirrors with surface, where you know its potentials are very many in the industrial base of this country. So this is just will trigger several such frontiers of technology, science, and engineering, and methods, and computational sciences, which will be beneficial to this country in pushing itself in the overall context of its development. I conclude my talk with a quick summary of the very recent telescope that has been launched, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. This idea is to detect shock emission from first to start. Again, it's a telescope with a, a 6.5 meter telescope very we can see very distant universes for stars and galaxies dust clouds so see that because it has got a bio, bio, infrared capability which is which allows the radiation to go through the uh, dust and things other other kinds of matter in the interstellar or intergalactic medium study galaxy evolution over time so you can really map the galaxies and search for signatures of life they gain a very interesting area and you can see this is the kind of a tub. All I want to say is a huge complex telescope which took 25 years in me making a primary telescope, primary mirror of 6.5, a secondary mirror, scientific instruments are put inside, and then you have a huge thermal sheet. That even though the telescope itself is 6.5 meter, I want to say that the sun shade that is there to prevent radiation like the solar light, moonlight or even earth light and other kinds of stray light from stars, there is a shade. And that shade is the size of a lawn tennis uh, court. So one can see how big this kind of thing. And there are five levels of shading simply because they use this concept, you know, you know, the thermos flask has got two walls. If you've got a multi-wall thermos flask, there are five of them here. You take the radiation, you allow it to multiply uh, reflect and then escape. So one, at every level, you also make the vacuum in such a way that it becomes a good insulator. Through this multiplicity of physical phenomena, you can virtually reduce the ultimate uh, temperature that one is trying to do this with 18 mirrors is the telescope size, precision deployment in the space, because you cannot put this whole thing in this full form in a rocket, so you need to fold them. So you need to have a technology to unfold them reliably precision deployment, thermal shield I mentioned, the huge this thing, sun shield coating, aluminized uh, coating is a, another kind of a thing that, so these are some of the key technologies that they are this thing. You can see here on one side we need for keeping the scientific instrument cool, you need minus 233 degrees Celsius. On the other side which is facing the sun, your solar panels, communication, and that temperature will be 185 degrees plus in Fahrenheit, the cell Celsius. So one can see the amount of reduction in the temperature that you had to affect. That's why very interesting ideas about the temperature reduction from 358 degrees Kelvin to 40 degrees Kelvin has been designed and implemented 
in this uh, particular telescope. And of course, I, I don't want to go more into the details of this. This is just in space. It has been launched. It is put at 1.5 million mile, uh, mil mil uh, miles away in a place called the Lagrangian point two in the Indian, in the solar system. These are Lagrangian points are located such that the movement of these points with respect to Earth and the Sun or Earth, Moon and uh, the object, they go together. So they go as a, almost like a triangle moving, rotating itself. And, the, and they have put it in such a way that the, the telescope instruments will never see the sun. So that way you reduce all the load and the thermal load with respect to the direct instruments, which need to be kept cool mainly because they are infrared and they don't want any extraneous temperature uh, swamping the signals that they otherwise are supposed to detect, which is at a very low level. In closing, large science programs are exciting. And India has a lineup of programs in place and all these programs other than the James Webb telescope now, which I'm sure a lot of Indians will work in looking at the data from this. Uh, all of them, India is a partner not only in science, but in technology and industries also participate. That's a fantastic, unique way in which we synergize the various activities to have an overall impact on the Indian science and technology. Your pursuit can offer different kinds of opportunities you can get here. Now, what do these kind of things mean? On the theory, you have analytical view of problems, mathematical framework, and help calculate outcomes and make predictions. Experimental work, exposure uh, design and calibration of instruments, understand measurement uncertainties, validate theoretical predictions. Data analysis, exposure to mathematical modeling of data, stock market to global performing, uh, go, uh, good background for data analytics and simulation, simulated data generation, optimization. And so there are multiplicity of possibilities. This is only a typical statement. Uh, there are many possibilities for those who are interested to be a part of this excitement in a variety of ways in which <coughs> where their expertise could be brought to bear. All I would like to say at this particular thing, astronomy is in a very, very exciting era. And when Raman in his old age was asked by a youngster, uncle, what would you like to be if you were born again? He gave this answer. If I were to be reborn, I would opt to pursue astronomy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your words of wisdom. And we are highly enthusiastic and uncrazed and motivated with your kind presence. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Priti Mishra to conduct a question answer session. Our scholars and students are highly keen and they want to have words with you. Dr. Priti Mishra, please conduct a question answer session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful session. I would now like to request uh, our student, Mr. Anubhav Kumar Singh, to share his query. Anubhav, can you please? Yes, sir. Uh, unmute. Yes, yes, ma'am. I am unmuted. Good morning, everyone. And I am Anubhav Kumar Singh from the Department of Physics, School of Physical Sciences, Doon University. And it has been a very, uh, very honorable thing to have this conversation with Dr. Kasturi Rangan. So uh, my question is regarded this uh, research and development of research oriented institutions in India, because as we all know that uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan was also the head of the committee for the national education policy. So uh, my question is also regarding the brain drain that is happening across the nation. So uh, that in this 21st century for this nation to grow, we need research oriented people and the platform for research to grow. But we are also seeing this phenomena called brain drain where the smartest and the greatest uh, people working in this uh, nation are going towards foreign institutions, especially the US and the uh, European countries. So how we can uh, tackle this problem so that uh, India can also be a great research uh, hub. And uh, we also need great number of uh, great research oriented professors and faculty members in the future to train and guide more uh, scientists in this nation. So that is my question. 
Thank you, uh, Anubhav. I think it's a very thoughtful uh, question. Uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, uh, science is one area where interactions between different nations, different cultures is central to its growth besides technology. So to worry about the fact that many youngsters go and work away, away, away is not something which we should really lament, we should encourage. But what is important is we, they also will have to come back. And if I am sitting in Raman Research Institute, I should say with some level of authority and pride that a lot of youngsters who have worked in US and Europe and other places, they are coming back and they are working here and they are working as a part of these, some of these facilities which I mentioned just now. So that is the, the reverse process is also happening. Some of the best ones we are able to get only because they train in certain areas in US or in Europe or some other country. So it's quite obvious the two-way exchange where a lot of outsiders will come and work in India is something we need to increase. But so far as our thing is concerned, the education program we are trying to step up. You know, the Indra University Center for uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics, Ayuka in Pune, is one of the places where there is a lot of training going on for astronomers to make use of this kind of a thing. They are increasing it and they are tying up with many universities. The national education policy is trying to see whether we can have more number of such institutions, more number of universities develop this kind of capabilities through standards of excellence and with the kind of possibilities that India is providing, not only for space-based systems, but also for ground-based system, balloon-bound system, rocket-bound systems, and so on. There is a tremendous possibility today opening up for the new generation. All I can say is there is tremendous enthusiasm among the younger generation to work in India and look at the possibilities of the challenges that it, India offers. There are many reasons for it. Of course, West also is now finding it you know, difficult to go beyond a particular point. In fact, many of them are international programs only because of the fact that you need to share resources, you need to share capabilities, you need to share also industrial base. And in all these areas, India is right now playing a role. So we are on the upswing. But people like you, when you write, want to finally choose this kind of uh, opportunities, don't look at foreign countries as an alien country for science. It is an integral part of science. Make sure that you have your roots in India, work in India, and work from India, and work elsewhere also, but periodically. And this is the model, and we will support that kind of model, introducing a blind view that everybody Indian born here will work in India and only produce in India. At least not in high-level science, high-level technologies. I think there should be a global view on this, in which India should be a first-rate player. And that is where we are doing all this. I think the foundation is laid, but I think it is up to you to take advantage of it, take it further, and develop into viable models for science and engineering technologies to go further and also impact on the social and other areas of the country's life. Thank you. Good question. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay, I would now like to request uh, our student, Mr. Ishan Rayal, to share his query with us. Is it the last one? Yes, this is the last query. Mm, hello. Good morning. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, great talk, sir. Thank you so much. It was very enriching. And uh, my question is two-part question. The first part is, sir, what are your thoughts on NASA's Artemis program? And second, uh, to uh, a budding astronomer or somebody who is entering the field, which field of astronomy would you suggest that he or she should pursue? Should it be uh, asteroids, comets? Should it be black holes? Should it be intergalactic discoveries? Should it be planets? Should it be our own sun, especially with the solar Parker probe just touching the sun? So, sir, that is the two-part question that I would really like my answer. Thank you, sir. Oh, the Artemis. You know, yes, this sir. is a program which U.S. has been thinking to create a lunar base around the moon in an orbital uh, configuration. It has been, de de it's been delayed considerably, 
but currently now they are accelerating and they are trying to make sure that there will be a base from which can be a takeoff point to moon and to other objects in the solar system so i think it's an important step well thought out in terms of its objectives and technologically well feasible and in terms of resources certainly would need international collaboration and cooperation but i think this will be one of the key elements of the 21st century facility in the cis lunar space from which will be also a take off point for other locations in the solar system so far as the astronomy is concerned i worked in areas like uh, uh, cosmic x rays and that was a diffuse cosmic x rays and from diff that will tell you you know because of conjectures like inverse compton effect or thermal brain strong uh, how could you have it would have regard and whether it is also a remnant diffuse cosmic rays like the the, the cosmic background microwave background whether there is an extension of that so there is an interesting thinking about it my interest on cosmology astronomy physics and a little bit of mathematics together made me choose that kind of a thing later on i went deeper into that astronomy i got into atmospheric sciences and not the environment i think once uh, there are two tracks in which it will go two or three tracks one is you pick one of these and you make it a lifelong mission this is what joseph weber i gave you idea of gravitational wave even though he did not detect it but the fact remains that it was his lifelong mission even at the age of 91 his funding was stopped by nasa but he still worked on the gravitational wave so that is the one way to look at it another way is be an opportunist not in the bad way the good way that you try to move to other areas because they are, they are becoming more interesting more this thing for example a person who was working on atmospheric sciences would like to do modeling in the global change those kind of thing or a fellow in the economics would like to look at the social implication beyond economics so those kind of so you can make those changes and uh, lastly of course uh, one can also see a totally new area you get into and for example gravitational there are many people who worked on the theory looked at the way the template for the radiation and how the chap signal will look like which in the final moment of coalition and there were uh, several people across the world india had about 15 20 people who worked on this in their lifetime if you ask sanjeev durandar even today he started his work in this even today sanjeev works in this so he has a love for that but to pick up a area like this to work on a model to create a template and to be validated several tens of years later needs a certain mental attribute and if some of the people have got so if you ask my question i think it is all your outlook how you want to move yourself uh, and i don't i can only say that there is nothing to choose in an astronomy every one of the area is now coming back including optical you see the 10 meter which is considered the oldest of the astronomy and i personally feel the choice should be left to you and you have also the choice to move further and further and keep changing to derive the best of excitement and also outcomes uh, from the emerging areas i don't think there is a one uh, solution one short solution for this kind of a thing thank you very much thank you sir thank you very much for your valuable inputs and motivating all the faculty members the scientists and scholars you are role model for all of us and i'm sure that with your presence uh, dhun university will definitely make its presence felt to the academia your presence uh, remember me as verses in uh, bhagavad gita lord krishna says in uh, chapter 3 21st verses yat da charati shreshta tat devo taro jana yat pramanam kurute lokast danu vartate which means whatever action is performed by a great person common men follow his or her footsteps and whatever standards he or she sets 
by exemplary acts all the world pursues so you are role model for all of us all the university fraternity is delighted with your uh, significant uh, you know contribution with your presence and your world value of words wisdom now we will shift to a second part of this session uh, doon university with uh, sndt women's university mumbai and samvardhan nyas new delhi is going to organize an international conference on bhartiya women a true perspective i would like to invite our honorable vice chancellor madam dr professor surekha dangwal to brief about the international conference and then you are requested to release the poster for this forthcoming international conference thank you so much thank you so much sir uh, i would like to uh, welcome and extend my thanks to dr bindeshwar pathak he is also connected with us a person who introduced indigenous technology to uh, make the country more clean and by introducing sulab swachalay he was one of our speakers during pandemic in our friday series uh, we welcome you dr pathak and before i say something about the conference uh, on behalf of doon university i would like to invite dr uh, kasturi rangan ji to doon university in person if he allows us to do so we will be happy the whole state of uttarakhand will be happy with his visit to inspire the young mind now about this conference we have dr leena gahane and dr madhuri marathe with us actually this is the conference quite connected with the national education policy where we have to talk about our own uh, narratives our own things our own lenses to look into the problems whatever the research methodology especially the social science methodology we are working on the western framework of looking into the problem of women problem of the society because women is the center part of not only the family but the society so having said this we decided to have this conference in a very grand manner and uh, we are very happy that uh, we have this idea that maybe our honorable prime minister will be visiting doon university if possible uh, that's why we have proposed the third week of april and not decided the date yet but all the things are going on and our organizing committee dr leena the advisor of nag bangalore and uh, dr ujula vaicha <coughs> the university and dr madhuri marathe from samvardhini these are the collaborative partners they all requested or they all just uh, express their views if dr kasturi rangan will uh, unveil this brochure and release this brochure for this international conference it would be a great help uh, madam uh, dr leena if you can speak just a couple of lines about it. yeah thank you thank you very much dr surekha ji namaste kasuri rangan sir ji i was uh, listening to you about the astronomy basically i am a, a physics background person professor in physics and my area of interest is superconductivity i was very delighted to hear about as so many things about astronomy from you uh, and it was a great honor that you are there and uh, you are you, you'll be you know inaugurating our uh, information brochure rightly pointed out by dr surekha we are trying to mainstream the narrative about bhartiya women we try to showcase uh, through this particular conference the success stories about the bhartiya women in all walks of life in many of the conferences sir we had been discussing only on the problems but in this particular conference we will be talking about the success stories in which the women has overcome all the problems and converted into uh, the opportunities or the solutions uh, so uh, we invite you rightly pointed out by dr surekha to this particular conference and now i request uh, surekha ji as well as kasturi rangan sir ji uh, to uh, you know unveil the uh, brochure over to surekha ji good i am i am happy to release this brochure of the conference bharatiya women a Thank true perspective at and with doon university and organizers a grand success for this conference thank you so much sir, for this very interesting uh, conference you are organizing 
we we discussed so much about the role of women in this country in different facets of its development and other areas and i'm extremely happy that you have taken this initiative i am sure this will also pave way for many other universities to think on similar lines and bring the potential that is so much present among the women uh, to the fore and benefit the development of this country in the process thank you so much and it is a privilege for me to be asked to do this please along with the honorable vice chancellor of your university i thank both of you and i thank you for organizing this sri professor leena gani all the best thank you thank you very much sir for releasing international conference poster uh, this uh, international conference uh, will be organized in collaboration with sndt university, women university mumbai honorable professor ujjwala chakradev vice chancellor of sndt women university is also present at the moment we have uh, dr madhuri marathe uh, samvardhan nias new delhi from samvardhan nias and uh, dr leena gahane nac advisor Uh, at this moment thank you sir thank you very much now i would like to invite uh, dr ashvesh daure uh, young scientist of the university he is heading a school of biological sciences here and as i have mentioned that we have two scientists uh, rated among 2% scientists of the world by stanford university dr ashvesh is one of the scientists uh, i would like to invite uh, dr ashvesh daure to propose word of thanks dr ashvesh thank you professor prohit uh honorable chief guest dr k kasturi rangan honorable vice chancellor professor surekha dangwal other honorable vice chancellor who joined us today uh registrar dr ms mandrawal distinguished professors my colleagues and dear students a very good morning to all it is my uh, great honor to deliver the vote of thanks for the today's uh, program on behalf of dune university i extend my gratitude to our honorable chief guest uh, dr kasturi rangan to take out uh, time from his busy schedule to grace the event and deliver such an informative and inspiring and knowledgeable talk on national science day thank you sir i am sure that our students and also school students who joined us today uh, will inspire from your talk i must thank our honorable vice chancellor professor dangwal for encouraging us to organize today's event and addressing all of us on national science day thank you ma'am i would also like to express my gratitude to all esteemed professors faculty members and students of dune university and schools for their presence and active discussion to make this event a great success i must thank the research and innovation cell team for organizing today's event i would also like to thank our technical team and other staff members for conducting this event online without any technical glitches finally thank you everyone once again for making it a great success thank you thank you thank you very much sir, dr ashish thank you professor dr kasturi rangan saab dr leena gahane and you, vice chancellor of uh, different universities thank you very much for joining this uh, uh, important day of uh, science uh, national science day and all the participants are invited to international conference which is scheduled in the month of april thank you thank you very much thank you very much jai hind jai hind